Blog Talk Radio. Blog Talk Radio. But victory is the least that men play cricket for. They play it for a host of reasons, ill-defined and hard to see. On school ground, on city street, on village green, they play on. For the urge wells deep from quiet places, in men and in the land they spring from. Hello and welcome from the World Cricket Show. My name's Ben Manning. And what a wonderful piece of poetry there from Ralph Richardson and John Arlott back in the 1950s in a Pathé historical documentary about the history of cricket, reflecting today's subject matter, which is very much the history of cricket, or rather South African cricket. And over the next half an hour, I'll be speaking to Dr. Dean Allen, whose book, Cricket, War and Empire in South Africa, is coming out this summer. It's a unique social history of the workings of the British Empire in South Africa during the late 19th century and covers the extraordinary man known as Douglas Logan, a Scotsman, uh, who made not only a name for himself in that part of the world, but became a local legend. Certainly is a fascinating read and includes comprehensive background on the Anglo-Boer War. Cecil Rhodes is on record as saying he had only met two creators in South Africa, one being himself and the other James Douglas Logan, who was born in Reston in Scotland in 1859. Logan emigrated to South Africa at the age of 19. This book explores how Logan made his fortune in 19th century South Africa through business, politics, and a high-profile association with the British Empire's favourite sport, cricket. Unique photographs and documents from the Logan family, archives, many of which have never been published before, form an integral part of the publication. A native of Somerset, of course, where I reside, uh, in the West Country of England, Dr. Dean Allen's long association with South Africa began in the mid-90s. And Cricket, War and Empire is a result of a doctoral study that took many, many years indeed. He's a lecturer in sports management at Cape Peninsula University of Technology, and Dean has taught universities in South Africa, Australia, Northern Ireland and England, and is widely published in the areas of sports history and sociology and certainly it's a pleasure to have him on the show today. So welcome, Dr. Dean Allen. Hello, Dean. Hello. Fantastic. Excellent to have you on the line, Dean, and wonderful that you could join us here today. Your book is of tremendous interest to me because I'm fascinated by the history of of the empire and uh, the British Empire and its workings, um, of course, with cricket, a kind of synonymous. Um, The Obviously, the important question um, is how did you get the idea for the book, was it something that came um, naturally that you've always been interested in, or is it is it something that you had an experience where you met somebody and it really made you think? How, how did the genesis of the book begin? Yeah, well, it, um, first of all, it's, you, you know, the book the book originates from um, from from my PhD, which was uh, was a ten year journey really. Yeah. I, uh, I first came to South Africa in um, in the mid mid nineteen ninety. I began, a, I began an undergraduate degree in sports studies at Cardiff. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and during that time, I, I visited South Africa for the first time, fell in love with the country, and started to really sort of become fascinated with the history of South African sport in general. Um, I was looking at, I was looking at um, rugby in those days. I was looking at kind of rugby and Afrikaner nationalism. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, that sort of uh, led me to that kind of period, the late Victorian period, around the time of the Boer War. Um, and I realized this was the time that the first cricket and rugby tours were brought down to South Africa in, in the 1880s, 1890s. Um, yeah. Anyway, one thing led to another. I, I, I did my master's degree at Stellenbosch University. So I had two, two years, uh, two or three years uh, based down here in the early 2000s doing that. And... Um, that, that, uh, during, the, during that master's degree, I, I was looking at sport during the anglo Boer War. Um, and then I, I, I visited this place called Mikey's Fontaine, but I, um, I became aware that it was significant in the, in the cricket history of South Africa, and there was a lot, there was a lot of missing uh, kind of information. Um, 
that, that led me really to a PhD that looked at kind of cricket and imperialism, cricket and the British Empire in South Africa. Mm. And as you're probably aware, and I mean, other people have written about cricket in Australia and the West Indies and India, but not mm. many people had, had, had given South Africa the same treatment. Because I, was, because I was here and I was used to the archives and um, obviously I was based here, um, I could really sort of uh, get my teeth into writing a decent PhD about this and uh, I think I've really con contributed to that kind of area. So, mm. so uh, that's where the book comes from. Um, mm. The PhD was completed in 2008. Of course, then the challenge was to turn this into a, into a, a book that was accessible for the, for the popular market um, whilst retaining its kind of, you know, the academic and its integrity, really. Yeah. Um, so that's so that's why it's it's uh, now it's 2015 and the book has come out. So I had a bit of a bit of drama with the publisher last year, which was a bit unfortunate. So, but it all worked out well because I've now signed with Penguin Random House, um, which is fantastic. And I've got I've got this uh, I've got this beautiful book, and I it's, uh, I'll show you it there. I mean, I, it's the one and only copy. It's the advanced copy, and it's absolutely stunning. You know, I, I can't stop looking at it. Look at that. You know, I myself, I'm a huge. Uh, fan not just of uh of cricket but but of of writing i i i enjoy very much writing myself um just for a hobby mainly you know i've had a few few books uh, uh published but um my great passion in some you know is uh much anything more wonderful to, to marry two, two pastimes and and uh, well two passions in your case quite clearly but goodness me i know what you're talking about with Publishers, it's a very rocky road now for authors, uh, whether yeah. self-published or or with the mainstream publishers, because a lot of self-published books are okay. But um, yeah. it, you yeah. know, it, it is a, a minefield out there, and I'm really pleased Scott with a great publisher. It's quite clear that it's a very you know fascinating piece of work. I'm a great lover of cricket history, and I don't think there's enough of it taught. Um, and I think uh, uh, the game is kind of steamrolling. Uh, in a kind of almost towards baseball with 2020. Not that although I know there's a place for it, but I always feel it's great to look at the history of the game and embrace it because uh, even though we all think we've invented everything uh, now, you know the game's got an amazing history and, and we're part of that history. No, of course, and I mean you. I mean, it, uh, you, I mean yes, it is an absolute privilege to be able to write this book. But of course, it's part of my career as well. I'm, I'm lucky enough to have worked in, uh, you know, I'm an academic working in sports departments. Mm -hmm. uh, my specialist is my specialism is, is sports history, sports sociology. But yeah. I've always been I've always been more interested in not the sport per se, but what it actually represents, what it represented in certain time um, periods. And cricket, more than anything, as you know, in the in the, in the late Victorian period, was the game. I mean. Mm. Um, it was on the front and the back pages yeah. of the press. Uh, people like W. G. Grace and uh, George Lohman and people like this—they were they were household names. Well, hundred um, years earlier, of course, it was the national sport of America, wasn't it? Which is extraordinary. Well, of course, yeah, of course, yeah, of course. I mean, I, I, I spent some time two years ago, privileged enough to be to, in the, the National Sports Library over there and uh, yeah. digging around the archives around Philadelphia and places like that. And you realise it could have been it could have been instead of baseball. I mean, there was yeah. there was that about. But in terms of in terms of South Africa, not as I said, not many people, given given the political background of the country, had actually taken the time to, or not taken the time, but actually gone in and and and, and did a real thorough um, writing of the, of the history. I mean, a lot of a lot's been written about South African cricket, as you're aware, I'm sure. But to, but for for an Englishman to come down here and sort of invest 20 years of his life, um, sort of telling the story this end as well as that end, knowing, knowing, you know, having the link. And the beauty, of course, of the, the focus of this book is it tells the story of how a Scotsman, ironically, came to South Africa, made his fortune, but in the, in the you know, in the, in the meantime, <laughs> he used cricket as a, as, a, as a means just for his own personal advancement, but also it promoted the game down here because he, um, I know we talked about it in the past, we, he, he bought, he bought um, you know, two of the English cricket teams down under Lord Hawke in the 1890s and, mm -hmm. and then of course famously he took, well not so famously actually, the most fascinating thing about the whole, the whole saga is he took his own team in 1901 to England to, to play, play throughout Britain while the Anglo Boer War was still raging. And, wow. uh, and and Conan and this is where cricket sort of transcends, it goes beyond sport. Arthur Conan yeah. Doyle, no, oh, yeah. none other than 
the writer of Sherlock Holmes, yeah. wrote in the press, how dare, how dare this team arrive on our shores when they should be fighting, you know, a war back in, the, in their own country. And it was, so you had all this controversy going on, but yeah. of course, it was, it was all PR and it was all spin and it was in it. And a lot of it was about money as well, of course. I mean, it's the <laughs> day's amateurs and it was a sham, of course. And, uh, yeah, yeah, well, uh, it's, so it's, it's, it's a fantastic nice. story that runs around yeah. it. It sounds it's quite apt your story there because of Scotland playing in the World Cup of course 2015 World Cup um, last night and uh, no I think that baseball as you say I mean baseball and cricket they're kind of cousins you have to explain to Americans when you're over there that actually um, as far as I've I've read um, uh, cricket cricketers more or less invented baseball or certainly the great statistician of baseball was a cricketer from Exeter and uh, it, it's it's obviously it's an all-American sport, but there is a direct cricket link, and uh, it's something that one has to sort of explain to them. But one doesn't know how they're going to react. <laughs> well, I've got, I've got, I've got, yeah, I've got, a, I've got a few American colleagues, sports historians, and it's always a tricky subject to broach that one. But they will acknowledge that, of course, that the first, the first people that were playing baseball were predominantly cricketers and cricket clubs. You know, it was, it was almost a, it was a spin-off yeah. kind of sport, and. Um, no, it, 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 no, it's absolutely, it's absolutely fascinating how that sport certainly was entrenched in America, but then in other parts of, of the ex empire, of course, then it was, then it was easy, more easily transferred. In South Africa, of course, it was played. This is where the new history of cricket comes out. People like Andre Odendal, who have written, written the, I was lucky enough to write the foreword to this book. I mean, he's written some wonderful books about the history of African cricket and how, mm-hmm. how entrenched that was. You know, over a hundred years of real, real um, rich um, cricket history that that hasn't been written about until recently because people haven't um, explored those kind of avenues. I've, I've acknowledged that here, but my, as I said, my my book is more about the role of James Logan and the role of cricket, especially in the Western Cape and throughout South Africa, how how, how cricket was used politically. People like Cecil Rhodes, of course, knew, knew the power of cricket and was involved in in, in, uh, in picking, almost hand-picking the, the teams that, that were sent to England in those days because they had to be representative of, of a South Africa that they wanted to, you know, to, 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 to be seen throughout the empire. And, of course... Um, so the days, the days of uh, the days of uh, equality in sport, certainly uh, uh, inequality in sport, should I say, certainly predated apartheid, and, and that's what this book also shows. Given a lot of my uh, talks here and back in the UK, mm. and often not everybody's a cricket fan. I know we're we're talking to a cricket audience, but often people mm. say, "Well, it's, this book is about cricket." But after after I've explained the, the, the story in the book, they they actually say, "No, I can see the bigger picture." So as I said, the game represents a lot more than just the, the stats and the, the batting figures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, see, it's so political, isn't it? I mean, the thing is, people say sport and politics aren't are nothing to do with each other, but I think John Arlott scoffed at that one many moons ago, and I tend to fall on the Arlott side. But it's, it's, it was only interesting to read last week that um, um, I think Austin, uh, the chap, the West Indian wicketkeeper, died, who ended up homeless, I believe, and went on the he went on the Rebel tour, of course, in uh, eighty-two, eighty-three, on the South African side. Um, it's the nearest we got to a match-up between South Africa and West Indies during their glory years. And with the so I'd say, West Indies cricket now, that's a whole other issue. But certainly with a tone such as yours, um, it highlights the political links all the more. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, at, the, at, that, at that stage, of course, South Africa was very much... Uh, a new member of the kind of empire club, and it was trying to. Uh, well, various people were trying to push that. Obviously, Rhodes and the likes of likes of Abe Bailey and, and Logan and these kind of these lieutenants. Um, yeah. Australia, of course, was the big, uh, the, 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 you know, the big partner in that club. But then, of course, Abe Bailey promoted the triangular tournament some year, a few years later after after this period. Um, and and it, it and it was all about using sport and using cricket, especially the sport of cricket, to to actually enhance the empire, to actually entrench it as, as, a, as a as a as a as a tangible thing. And as I say to my students, actually, I mean, the, the, even even lives on in the Commonwealth Games. I mean, there, there is still a the, the, this whole idea of sport bringing people together in this this empire club still exists in the form of the, of the Empire Games. And the fact, of course, that. Uh, 
that uh, countries still want to beat the, uh, the, you know, the mother country, the country that introduced it in the first place. I mean, well, yeah, I, I, I don't know if England, England's still a big scalp, but uh, certainly <laughs> Africa, New Zealand uh, and Australia, down here in South Africa, England's the team that they don't want to lose to, so it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Well, it's funny, isn't it? I mean, I suppose there's always a silver lining to to an empire, however despotic. But but no, with England, it does seem mildly comical, really. Um, though looking at the current state of the UK, but that's another issue. But no, I mean, looking yeah. forward with 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 empires and and the like, other with the empire and the league empire. It's interesting, you know. You look at India and how. Um, you know, I'm not a fan of the IPL, but obviously India is it, so far, hopefully, touch wood for the time being, cricket is flourishing out there. Uh, there's been talk that the West Indies uh, have almost turned their back on cricket. They're kind of continuing with the team as they are, but it's obviously very messy. Um, and that there's been a positive outlook on that that I've heard uh, in recent years on Radio 4 in a documentary I remember hearing where the chap argued that the fact that they turned their back on cricket by turning their back and actually rejecting cricket in a sense it's sort of a feeling that they're perhaps leaving the empire actually behind I actually feel looking at all the nations playing cricket at the moment um, that, uh, that, that this this legacy is going to actually continue lo- looking forward uh, because I know that they're actually streamlining the amount of teams playing so probably cricket's the only sport that doesn't want to expand its teams but <laughs> seems to want to shrink them. Um, how, how do you feel it is looking forward with all these countries such as the Windies or India and, and the rest of them? I, I, very good question, very good question. I, I, I actually, I, I, taught, I, I teach a module called Sport and Empire which looks at how sport, various sports, not just cricket but, but football and, and rugby um, netball, hockey, how these sports were spread throughout the world. And of course, the, the, the British Empire was responsible for a lot of it. I also look at the, the, the countries that rejected British sport. I mean, obviously, America, Ireland, for various reasons. Um, so there's, there's certainly politics. But if you look at, um, if you look at the way, the way uh, of cricket is, is kind of reshaping, of course, India, albeit for, for financial reasons, is, is now the centre. But of course, not just for financial reasons, purely because they have more people playing cricket than anywhere else in the world. So just from a numbers point of view, um, as, as, as probably some people could say, it was inevitable that India, with being, being a, a very much a developed nation now, or developing nation, um, that they were, going to, they were going to do this. I mean, the West Indies is an interesting case. I mean, I was privileged enough to be at the uh, New Year's address at Newlands um, during the test match, and Sir Clive Lloyd gave a very interesting account of this. Um, and... and for, for somebody, uh, for an audience that was expecting a, a, a speech on, on, on the history of the game and the glory years of West Indies, I would say 80% of his, 80% of his speech actually um, referred to money and the finances of the game. And how he's, he is disillusioned how you know, certain West Indian players are turning their back on, obviously, the traditional form of the game in a test match. We were witnessing at Newlands almost a second string team, I mean, a team of mm-hmm. youngsters. Mm-hmm. Or mm. Chandler Paul or whatever, um, but but actually playing w- according to Clive Lloyd because obviously it was good for their career, but because they you know they they still have the pride to play for that badge. Whereas mm. I, I thought it was ironic on the very very last day of of the of the Test match, I was outside and I saw Chris Gale and Bravo and those guys in the net thinking, why are you not in the centre playing? And I thought that was quite upsetting actually. They were there in the nets outside obviously getting ready for the glory game which was the T20 the money was going to happen in a few days time so I saw it there with my own eyes but in terms of in terms of uh, the way the game's going I think this World Cup's going to be quite interesting I mean you always get shocks and surprises I I I think it's I you know I think it's it's fantastic that uh, that countries like Afghanistan for example Example and um, and also uh, countries that are, are struggling in other areas, Zimbabwe, are, uh, are there. They're competing. Um, mm. And why, why why shouldn't they be? And I think cricket cricket for all its politics, it also has got a very good effect on 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 you know bringing people together and actually giving people a sense of pride. And I think I think I think that's interesting. Going back to your earlier point, yeah, the, I don't think anybody can separate cricket from politics. Um, throughout its history, it's been a political game, like most sports, of course. And mm. uh, the irony, of course, um, you know, people, people certainly the Victorians who introduced the game throughout the world would say it was it was certainly not connected with money and politics. But we know now that it certainly is. Uh, <laughs> The way the game, the, the way the game has changed. Um, mm. You know, I, I I tell my students. You know, I said, well, one day cricket hasn't been around for that long. You know, within the history of the game, and they can't see it because that is the that is the you know the colours, the the razzmatazz, that's the game that they consume.
Mm-hmm. And so, it, it, you know, they're used to. So uh, it's, it's interesting. I think, I think, yeah, we're all Test Match fans and we like the traditions of the game. But I think we've also got to see that perhaps, and I'm saying this kind of uh, through gritted teeth, that the shorter versions of the game have, have elevated cricket to certain areas where it probably wouldn't have got before. So I just hope that, yeah, I, I, and I, can, I hope that the Test Match um, renaissance continues because I, I think... That's the great. Yeah. yeah, well, it's, it's interesting, you know, it's a kind of catch-22. One doesn't know, it's a bit like if the internet didn't exist, we did things in a different way before, and somehow managed to get around and do things. And in the same sort of way, I always think that if 2020 hadn't come along, even one day cricket, that, you know, people it would accept what they're given, and we'd, we'd see tests played around the world, who knows? That's my, my alternative universe that I live in. <laughs> but, uh, of, course. of course, of course. But I'm afraid, that, I'm afraid that box in the corner has changed everything. If people can just switch on they, and they want to be entertained, don't they? This is the thing. So through TV, uh, they want quick fix and quick fix entertainment. And that's, that's, that's how it's all, all evolved. And uh, mm. you know, I, I think as soon as we had a T20 World Cup, we realised that it was there and it was probably there to stay. So, I mean, that's, it's interesting. Um, but, uh, I, you to the book um, itself in terms of the the structure of the book it's such a huge tome as you've shown me um, you know w- 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 what is the structure of the, each chapter and how much do you go into the actual cricket cricket that went on as opposed to the actual politics was that quite difficult were you feeling you wanted to give a count of matches all the time rather than talk about the politics or how, how did it work exactly yes yeah yeah I mean I mean it was written it was written as a sports history PhD so cricket features throughout every chapter. Mm. The challenge, of course, when you turn something like this into a book is you have to go away from the themes and make it more of a coherent kind of read. So what, I, what we decided to do was when the life of James Logan, this, the, this, this, you know, this Scottish entrepreneur, this colourful character, and basically you use his life story and to run his story throughout the book. But I, I, there's a chapter, for example, on, on obviously his arrival, but there's a chapter predominantly on South African cricket history when I talk about how the game arrived um, and you know how it emerged and, and it's and it, how it was played amongst the different population groups um, then I go on to, to look at how the early tours were affected or how, how they affected the development of the game and obviously Logan's involvement as well as Rhodes and people like that and then um, then the, of course the, the war uh, the end of war which the South African war um, which affected everything that features quite quite prominently um, but also cricket features, as I said, the 19 tour, which, which a lot of cricket histories have not acknowledged. I mean, it was a first-class tour. Um, it, it was Logan's team, but they were the South Africans, and he took them over, and of course, it, a lot of it was for his own personal advancement, and it, and it met with controversy. But the fact that it took place within, with it, with it, it took place within the context of, of, of wartime, um, and he got away with it, which was interesting enough. And, and you know, and various things happened on that tour. I mean, so... Africa's highest ever first class total was against Cambridge University and that, you know, is a, is a record that, that stood the test of time. Mm. So, it, 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 as I said, it went down into first class records in terms of the cricket history, but it stood for a lot more. And then, of course, on the back of that, James Logan came back and he attended, he attended the coronation of Edward VII because of all his achievements in the game. And this is a working class Scot that arrived in South Africa at the age of 19 and he was a millionaire within three or four years. Wow. And, of course, they talk about how that was achieved and that was not through cricket, of course. And so, a fantastic story. Um, but cricket features because, as I said, it represents a lot more than just the game. What it what it actually stood for at that time was was the game of empire, and it needed it needed benefactors such as this in, individual to actually promote it. So, well, think, yeah, what's more fascinating is the fact that you know again you know people sometimes tend to rather unfortunately, and I suppose it's, it's natural to an extent because you tend to see more perhaps right-wing politicians at, at cricket events, not that the, the parties have that much of a difference these days, but looking back traditionally, there's always been those on the left that did attend cricket and love cricket, and there's always been working-class people. Look at Harold Larwood, but it sounds like he's from a poor background. I definitely think what's important about your key individual is that he was from a working-class background. Poor background. It's not this sort of classic image of the, um, the upper-class gentry of the upper class toff or whatever, what hair that sort of gets there with it all with a silver spoon kind of thing that, you know, gets <laughs> on a plate and plays cricket in Captain's England partly because of privilege. It sounds to me like you've got quite a, a diamond of an individual, someone from quite a, a working class background who, who made it from nothing. 
I think what he I think what he did then. I mean, my 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 main um, one of my main um, conclusions was Logan needed a needed something that was going to buy him class, buy him social elevation. He mm-hmm. was new money, if we could call it like that. So um, he um, he cricket, of course, he could he could then pay money into the game, but it also brought him favours. So it brought the likes of Lord Hawk down, this aristocratic Yorkshireman, and you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. So Hawk got a couple of long tours and holidays in South Africa, and then when Logan went back to England, as he did often, he then got in- invitations to Ascot and the MCC, and, and you know, he was he was accepted. And, the, the, uh, you know, the whole the whole uh, a story behind him being uh, invited to the coronation of Edward VII in 1902 bears testimony to the power of the game and his influence on it. Uh, um, so he was a cricket fan. There's no doubt about it. He enjoyed he enjoyed cricket. And if you if when the England teams went to his uh, went to his town that he created, Mikey Fontaine, it was mm. customary to let Logan at least get into double figures when he batted in one of these um, one of these games. Um, if you yeah. got him out before that. I think it was poor form, but he, he, he certainly put on a party for them. But he was uh, he was very aware of what the game stood for, and I think it could it certainly it certainly uh, allowed him to um, to operate in circles he probably wouldn't have done in in other areas. And of course, to be a good sportsman during that time brought you entry into a lot of areas. Mm. You never mentioned money. You never mentioned politics. And of course, the beauty about this guy. Everything he says is quite tongue in cheek because he knows it's political. He knows it's money driven, and you can tell that by some wonderful quotes I've got throughout the book. Um, no, it's a fantastic story. I honestly think that, that there will be a series or even a film made about this because it's a it's Danton with substance. It's Danton Abbey that really, you know, with a with a with a really strong cast as, as such. And I, I think it's it's fantastic. I mean, it's, it's for me, it's been a privilege to tell this story, and it's the Kind of book, Ben. To be quite honest, if 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 Mikey Fontaine and James Logan w- w- were in Britain, there would have been probably a dozen books written about him and the place he created. Um, and it's been my privilege to end up in South Africa to be able to tell this story, you know, myself. It's funny though, because 2020 crowds, you know, seem to be getting bigger. But when you actually look back through time, generally across all the cricketing playing countries, um, years ago, back in the 50s, the 40s, and, and further back. Um, the crowds generally seemed a lot larger than they are today. Seemingly uh, getting larger, but ironically, when you look back through time, you know, you could argue the game's been in decline for some period, not just test cricket, but, but the whole of the sport, simply because, you know, you look at the 1950s crowds in England at test matches and in the West Indies, of course, you know, in Trinidad to play Jamaica or whatever, it would be packed to the rafters, not even an international match. Um, c- crowds used to be absolutely huge. English English cricket and that summer sport, um, second to football, and of course it got degraded here in the 90s by the BBC or d- down, downgraded or whatever through the government. Uh, I don't know if that was to do with England losing a lot, but uh, no, I mean, it, it's, it really is fascinating because, you know, looking back through the history with, with, with the character you've got there, it reminds me a little bit of W.G. Grace and that you weren't really allowed to get him out. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, the, the irony is uh, Logan wanted to get WG down because the, he was very much a PR expert, Logan. He bought his own newspaper, so every every story that came out about him was good news. Um, mm-hmm. And WG Grace was his, one of his biggest, biggest ambitions. He wanted to bring WG down to South Africa, but... Uh, um, he, WG turned around and said, no, my days of touring are, are, are done, I'm afraid. He, he got WG as he was in the twilight years, but he, he did manage to arrange a game with London County, and they played at the Crystal Palace, and uh, I've got a wonderful picture in the book of, of Logan's own son, Jimmy Logan, sitting between WG Grace's leg, legs in the in the team picture. And, of course, this was the only time that G, uh, James Logan's son ever played first-class cricket, and it happened to be for South Africa. So if you take your own team away to, to England, you make sure you pick your son, which is a wonderful story. But, uh, of course, <laughs> yeah, like Alex it's, all about, it's all about privilege. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Alec and Mickey Stewart, mind you, Alec more than proved himself yeah. in the end. But people always, okay. in a way, you got it against you all the more if you like Stuart Board. Yeah. Your dad, dad is looking down your down his neck at you. You know, it's uh, people are always going to write you off, perhaps a bit more. I guess that's why both and son, you know, went into rugby instead. <laughs> but, uh, it, would be, it would be, I think, it would be a bit like Kerry Packer picking his team, picking his own son to play. I think that would be the equivalent <laughs> here. I think. <laughs> What a character he was, goodness me. Yeah. yeah, it really is a wonderful book, and, and I can't wait to read it, and I'm sure a lot of my listeners are all feeling the same way. I'm looking forward to getting well, the copy. 
Yeah, it will be available. I just should just say a bit of publicity. It would, it, um, it's going to be released here in South Africa on the 1st of April. As I said, Penguin Random House is a publisher. Um, we're going to distribute it in the UK most likely from July onwards. Um, right. And if, if, any, if you, any of your listeners want uh, further details, they can contact me at, um, via my website, which is deanallen.co.za. Um, so that's the best way. Um, I'll contact you, Ben, and you can put them in touch. But uh, as I said, it'll be, I'm determined it'll be readily available via Amazon and throughout the UK as well from July onwards. So I'm just as excited as promoting it um, back at home as well. So I think it's got as big a market there. Well, half half the battle is won through through uh, the mouth and through through the words that you've, you've uh, so eloquently put forward. I, I think that anyone listening is going to be fascinated both by what you talked about and also your enthusiasm. It speaks volumes, and it really is a wonderful project. And uh, it's wonderful to see the history of the game being covered. I always remember as a child listening to uh, Seasons to Savor on Test Match Special. It would usually be presented by Peter Baxter or Crystal Martin Jenkins. Uh, matches they talk about from the Victorian era. Um, as a child, I remember, you don't quite get that now. So it really is lovely to, to see a historian you know, looking at, at what really is one of cricket's great strengths, which is this history, as anyone who visits the Lord's Museum will, will attest. But uh, anyway, it's been lovely chatting to you, Dean. It really has been wonderful. Thank you so much for going through so much with me as well. You've covered so much ground and so quickly too. And perhaps we can speak again in future. It really would be lovely to welcome Super. you on board again. Super. Thank you so much for your support, Ben, and lovely speaking to you. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Sure, it'll be a bestseller, and you'll be winning awards for that like you've won awards for everything else, it seems. <laughs> a very multi-talented man. <laughs> you take Thank care. You have a good evening. Bye. Right. God bless. Take care now. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview there with uh, Dr. Dean Allen. What a fascinating project that is. And certainly it was a pleasure to talk to him all the way from sunny South Africa as well. And, uh, of course, South Africa keen to press home some sort of uh, victory at this year's World Cup. Let's see how they do. They certainly haven't won it thus far. And Dean's book, of course, is out in April. Uh, it's out later in the year in, in the UK as well. Uh, certainly, Dr. Dean Allen's Cricket War and Empire in South Africa is a unique social history of the workings of the British Empire and, of course, its connections with cricket. It's published by Penguin Random House, Zebra Press, and uh, it certainly will be a fascinating read when I get hold of my copy. Anyway, from me, Ben Manning, here at the World Cricket Show, thank you so much for joining me, and I do hope you join me again soon. For me, good night. Australians by eight wickets. Eight